so first of all, we're trying to figure out whether a, a conversation uh, between uh, a Marxist economist and yourself, would this have any sort of benefit for the message of uh, the, your post-Keynesian message, as well as what you're working on with climate change? Would that be a, a good way to summarize what? It depends. I mean, uh, it can be, you might as well tell me who the Marxist is. Okay. I'll... <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can do that. Uh, okay. Just, just uh, keep chatting while I do. Okay. <laughs> the reason, reason, reason I'm skeptical about this is that it's it's a bit like being the person who's dug up the body of Christ, and you go to the Vatican and try to have an appointment with the Pope to say I've got Jesus Christ's body in the back of my SUV. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it, 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 you're talking across purposes because according to the the Pope, there can be no such thing. So therefore, you must be uh, totally fallacious. And it just becomes a total waste of time. I'd be happy to have the experience of talking it over with one of them. But, you know, I mean, I've spoken to no Marxists and, and um, neoclassicals, so I was blue in the face over these things. And believe me, I really understand how Max Planck felt. Yeah. Okay. So you found the name? Okay. It's uh, Harry Cleaver. Harry Cleaver. Vaguely know the name. I was worried. It was, it was, I was checking to see if it was a guy called Alan, Alan uh, Kleiman. Uh, Andrew Kleiman, pardon me, yeah. uh, who's a jerk. And Andrew and I have had one stand-up fight, uh, otherwise known as a plenary address, at a conference in Spain about three years ago. Oh. Um, and, uh, yeah, it could be worth to give it a try. Why not find out what happens? Well, okay, well, but I want to try and maybe see, you know, because it, it, it depends how we're going to moderate it, right? Mm. It depends, like, mm -hmm. is, is it, is it, uh, 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 you know, effective to actually talk about something like climate change, right? Like make it themed about something as opposed to like an ideological conversation. Let's talk about, you know, you mean, you mean, you mean talk about climate change with the Marxist? Yeah, for example. I don't know. I'm, I'm just throwing. Well, I you'd, you'd need to find a Marxist who was who made that a research focus. I don't know that there right. are any. David Harvey might be a possibility, um, but. What has happened? I mean, what has happened with Marxism at one extreme? I'll give the Marxists one thing over the neoclassicals, and that is that Marxists are honest about their, not honest about their flaws, but honest about admitting they have flaws. Mm -hmm. In the sense that the big dilemma for Marx uh, and Marxists was what's called the transformation problem, and that is they have a theory of value and a theory of price, and the theory of value uh, argues that labor is the source of all profit. But the theory of price argues that profit is uniform across different industry sectors. Mm -hmm. And yet, if price is uniform, uh, you, you have different ratios of labour to capital in every industry sector. Uh, how do you manage to get uniform prices out of that? Now, it's a mathematical conundrum Marx thought he solved by an example he gave in the what became the third volume of Capital. But uh, it, was never, it wasn't a proper solution. It was one of these you know, curious this set of ar ar arithmetic numbers which appeared with like the like you managed to make three three lines intersect at one point, but mm -hmm. only at that one point. And if you moved away, you needed a general theory that covered the entire number plane, and Marx didn't provide it. And Marxists have, in fact, put it this way: I did my master's thesis on Marx. Mm -hmm. My master's thesis was looking at the uh, Marx's philosophy, uh, which is Hegelian philosophy, and how that affected his theory of value. And when I was in um, can I ask you a question as a layman philosopher? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> it, it's a really important, it's like a learning moment, right? So this is yeah, yeah. maybe what I'll do, because I love how you lecture. I might raise my hand and you can see me in the <laughs> audience. Say, yes, Daniel. <laughs> okay. I mean, we can okay, just then. On yeah. that, right? Okay, yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this um, this Hegelian thing, would I would I be correct in characterizing that it's uh, that subject-object, the dialectic, conversation like pitting two things off of each other right yeah uh, you are but what 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 is your framework for doing that if you want if you said ob subject object which is one way to talk about like base and superstructure and so on mm -hmm. but there's a particular line of jargon that people use which they think is marx's dialectic which is thesis antithesis synthesis this is one of the things that make it very hard to pronounce you yeah feel like i'm a little loop. You always get to the third one. You can't synthesis. I always get it wrong. Um, and I knew people said that was Mar Marx's philosophy. And I read all of Marx, everything he wrote in economics. I, I totaled them up one day. The, the books came to just below the height of a tennis net. Um, and a quick question, teacher. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So the, the thing is, as you're reading all of this, how do you, like, I find when I read something from Marx, yeah. I only take so much of it and I come back out, right? Because it just, it, it somehow like obscures my ability to, uh, to, you know, to think or to like, I lose my track. Right. So uh, I, yeah, know, I, mean, I have kind of like some go-to authors that I'll kind of go back to. We call it. No, I, 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 first time I read, first time I read Marx, I read Marx in the original in capital volume one. And um, that was back in 1973, 74, which is summer in Australia. And with a whole bunch of other lefties, we wasted our summer uh, in a corner of what's called the, um, main quadrangle at Sydney University in one of the philosophy department rooms, co collectively reading Marx mm. and methodically going through chapter to chapter, one you know, chapter one, blah, 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 blah. And that's always been my approach. I read something methodically. So I start with the original argument and I just read it uh, and, and I'm trying to make sense of it as I go. And I found a, what I thought was a brilliant exposition by Marx into where surplus came from using the concepts of use value and exchange value. I thought it was superb, but when I applied it to labor, it reached the result of labor produces a surplus, which is Marx's point. But I applied it to capital, machinery, and I got exactly the same answer. Machinery produces a surplus. Now, that was not what Marxist, Marxist believed. It's not what Marx said except twice uh, in his own writings. Um, so what I find is people, I, I, I tend to read someone and say, I want to understand what you think. Mm. And I think that's different. I want to know what you think. And yet I think when, when, when my own experience with these other lefties reading Marx, they were reading it like they were reading the Bible. Mm, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, when I gave up Catholicism, I became an agnostic, not a Buddhist or a Rastafarian or anything else. Some of the rest of your stuff is okay, um, but I, I, I just, I, I'd have, I don't have a belief system mm. in that sense, and so I just look for the logic. And Marx logically explained why labor was not the only source of value, in my opinion, in in, the, in chapter six and seven of Capital, and then obfuscated it from that point forward. Um, and but yeah, so when I came to read Marx and say, okay, where did the, where did he get this insight? Where did it go wrong? Uh, what I did in my master's was I, I li literally read everything Marx wrote on economics in chronological order, starting with the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844. So I read from that first page of that to the last page of uh, Capital Volume 3 in chronological order. Wow. That's, in, that's, that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, we'll get into I mean, what, what would you think that the, the, the Marxist is going to say? Like, what, what are the biggest bones they pick with you? Like, is it oh, it's, all, it's all over me saying that labor is not the only source of value. That's, that's the bone. And it's also, I mean, the bone will also come over whether they think the philosophy that I focus on is important or not. Like, for example, I taught a course in uh, Marxist economics um, I've never been maybe in a history of economic thought course with a guy. He's a he's a, he's a friend of sorts, a bit bit, bit difficult. He's got a rather bitchy personality, but anyway, I'll mention his name, Peter Chrysler at New South Wales University. <laughs> um, and Peter and I were teaching this course together when he was already a lecturer and quite well established, and I was doing my masters. I just turned up on the scene, and as we're explaining just to Marx to the students, Peter says. You shouldn't read the first seven chapters of Capital. It'll just confuse you. Start with chapter eight or chapter nine. And I didn't say anything. I was a bit subservient in those days Well, because I just turned up. I thought that that's ridiculous advice. The philosophical foundation of Marx's uh, approach to economics is in the first seven chapters, particularly chapter six and chapter seven from Mary. Um, so if you don't read that, you're just going to say, oh, Marx has a labour theory of value without knowing how he derived the labor theory of value. But in Marx's own mind, his greatest achievement was deriving the labor theory of value from his own philosophy. Now, because I say that, and then I show that, in fact, it contradicts the labor theory of value, it, it, it gives a solid foundation to a surplus theory of value, to a physical as opposed to utility theory of value, but it undermines the labor theory of value. Now, when I say that, of course, Marxists, you know, it's a bit like I'm saying Jesus Christ is a Buddhist. Mm. 